formally laid out town plans are considered a hallmark really of the medieval um, small town of which I'm talking from the period from sort of the 12th century onwards really here. So we have some typical features, uh, regular burgage plots, a street grid, marketplaces, those kind of things. And what we've got on here on the screen is what's called a plan analysis of Coventry undertaken by Keith Lilly. And what plan analysis has allowed scholars to do is to move from creating static typologies of urban spaces, so places laid out on a grid or places laid out as a ribbon settlement, to look at how places develop over time by identifying different plan units and how they relate to each other. So, for example, being able to see earlier features in the landscape as being fossilised within the urban landscape. And this calls into question um, the divide which exists in scholarship still between planned urban settlements, planted urban settlements of the kind maybe which Beresford was focusing on in his New Towns of the Middle Ages, and settlements which develop more organically because you can see both at play within these sort of dissected town plans. And as Michael Smith recently pointed out, uh, all development is planned to some degree. Um, you have to make a conscious decision to build something. So the organic idea is something of a misnomer. So I think that the character of this planning can tell us a great deal about the processes through which a town was founded and developed. But whilst planning is generally seen as a signature of urbanism to some degree, the process of planning is less commonly integrated with the consideration of broader processes of what I would call becoming urban. And perhaps this is because things like these, these plans, have been the domains of the historical geographer and the latter urban culture and society essentially has been the realm of the archaeologist or the historian. So I think settlement space has become separated from processes of dwelling. Now, as I pointed out already, planned versus organic is something of a false dichotomy. Towns vary for a wide variety of reasons. Was it a port? Was it a market? Was it on a major routeway? Was it founded on a virgin site or developed out of an existing settlement? Who was the lord? Why were they find, founding the town? Were they ecclesiastical or were they a lay landlord? And this variability, I think, is what underpins the difficulty which still exists in scholarship um, in defining what a town is. And it's telling, I think, that the principal best definition put forward by Chris Dyer is that it's a place with a primarily non-agrarian economy, which is so vague as to not be particularly helpful. And of course, a key reason for this is that planning is not something which is unique to towns. We've got on the screen a number of planned rural settlements um, in Yorkshire. Um, as some examples, that rural settlements too can have um, clear plans with defined Burgish plots and clear street grids. Um, we could also see this, for example, on the estates of Chersey Abbey in Surrey. Now, of course, landlords had varying motivations for founding settlements on their estate. They made a choice to bestow urban properties through a charter on a place or to keep the population down, as it were, as a rural settlement. So I don't think necessarily we can see in terms of planting a town in the landscape, but rather of these plans as a sort of physical entity emerging with the concept of urbanism or urban society. So how did plans become urban with the places of which they are a part? So not seeing the, the plans as a place or as a representation of the place, but as uh, sort of enrolled in a bigger process. So in addressing this question, we have to accept that urban is a broad term and that places develop similarities and connections at different scales. So rather than creating spatial typologies, I think we can shift to focus on trajectories of urbanism. So places unfold, they become materialised in the plans, but are performed and reiterated in different ways through related processes of dwelling. So it might be that through these trajectories, we can reunite spatiality and urban character and move from typologies to exploring networks or assemblages of urban society. So, assemblage theory, as it's called, has been increasingly influential with both within archaeology, I can see Ollie in the room, uh, so I need to watch what I say, and also in urban geography, and particularly in the work of Colin McFarlane, who has um, overseen a, a large dialogue in recent years on the, uh, the application of this assemblage theory to the city. And fundamentally, this sees places, people and things as mutually constitutive 
and finds parallels, I think, actually, in a recent discussion of the medieval town, which doesn't pay any attention to this literature, by Axel Christofferson in Archaeological Dialogues, who sees medieval towns as performances. So assemblage urbanism sees towns and cities as more than spatial entities, constructed of social relationships between places, people, spaces, resources, environment, places which are in a constant state of um, becoming as urban life is performed and reiterated. And I think this allows us to think through towns differently. Um, research, I think, reifies a false divide, really, between urban and rural, making town a loaded term. Increasingly, studies are questioning the stark divide between urban and rural in the medieval period. I think, for example, of some forthcoming work by Michael Lewis, who's looked at the distribution of typically urban finds in the countryside through the Portable Antiquities Scheme. And this really builds on um, historical literature that goes back into the 1980s, the writing of Rodney Hilton, for example, who saw small towns as being in many um, respects not particularly distinctive in terms of their social organisation from rural settlements. And maybe this is why we have difficulty in defining them, because they aren't stark, easily definable categories. So, if we view places as assemblages, they emerge from specific sets of social relations. And these social relations come to constitute them, constitute them and guide them along connected trajectories of development. So, through some lenses, we see a category of town, as places may be linked through common sets of social relations or processes emerging, whereas in others, we might see them as something quite different to rural life, or indeed, as not revealing themselves as a category at all. If we look through certain lenses, they'll be indistinguishable from the countryside. And this is the idea that I want to develop through um, a very rapid case study of three towns in the southern English county of Hampshire. So the first of these towns is Andover, a comparatively large urban centre where people clearly saw themselves as urban. The place had a borough charter and a guild merchant, um, so administrative um, elements that you would associate with the town, uh, and it clearly grew out from an earlier site. Um, there's a historically attested Villa Regalis here, an Anglo-Saxon royal site, although it's disputed where exactly it is, but one possibility is this enclosure up here around the church, which is fossilised in the landscape, and small quantities of pre-conquest pottery have been discovered from this area, but really this argument is a topographical one rather than an archaeological one. So how can we apply some of this theoretical thought to the understanding of Andover? Well, Gavin Lucas has identified two forms of assemblage, what he calls gathering assemblages and iterative assemblages. So gathering assemblages are processes of coming together. These are processes which localise action and materialise in the performance of place. So one example could be the act of deposition, for example. Iterative assemblages are more persistent. They're repetitive improvisations. And these processes of gathering have implications. They centre relations in particular places. For example, giving a place significance and therefore guiding future action back towards that place. So social relations can, if we use the jargon of the assemblage theory literature, um, growing out of the work of Deleuze and Guattari, we can see social relations as being coded. So if we see, as Deleuze and Guattari do, of a world made up of flows of matter and ideas which move randomly across a flat social plane, the processes through which they entangle are the gatherings um, or territorializations, and the implications of these gatherings are to make certain trajectories of action possible whilst barring others off, and that is this process of coding. So to return, if we must, to Andover, Andover is a persistent gathering place. It had, before it was a town, an informal market probably, and it clearly had a church, a minster church. And these presences in the landscape coded activity. Now by 1175, the place had a guild merchant, and this was an organisation set up to bring stability and secure lines of credit to the king principally. So it was in royal interests for the merchants to prosper. So we can see these as being process which processes which code these flows of people and goods across the landscape. So the performance of Andover reiterated its place as a place of marketing. Now, of course, this is something which was the case in numerous other places too, which didn't develop the distinctive administrative character of Andover. So we have to look 
beyond the archaeology. Andover was a royal manor um, throughout the medieval period, so the crown could benefit directly from formalised trade at this place. Royal expenditure was expanding through the 12th century due to wall uh, warfare and castle building, for example. So um, the securing of income was important. So I think in the materialised, in the plan, as it were, we can perceive of two sets of interactions um, coming together. So we can see a localised reiteration of the performance of place, the marketing activity, the worship, which has got, and even the administration, which has gone on here um, for centuries, um, colliding with a more dispersed network, which we could call royal activity. And money, really, was the key thing, I think, which flowed between these two um, scales. So we can see um, money as binding this dispersed royal network with this localised um, performance of place. And maybe it's in this tension that we can conceive of the agency for the guild merchant to be founded in emerging. And in 1205, the granting of the borough charter following. So whilst the growth of Andover mirrors that of other towns, it clearly materialised for me out of specific sets of social relations. By the 13th century, the form of Andover had changed considerably. We have the main street, uh, the Burgish plots going off of it, um, a regular marketplace and so forth. Now, the concept of plantation implies that a decision was made to build a town. But if we think about how the flows of goods and people and money had passed through this place, I think rather we can see that this isn't town foundation by decree, but rather we see the agency for town um, for urbanisation as emerging from these processes of iterative behaviour. Behaviour which had already coded social action, creating a place in which exchange could take place at the exclusion of other places and pushing it along a particular trajectory of becoming. And this behaviour was further coded by the administrative documents, which became enrolled in the repeated performances of place. And we can see that, for example, in the regulation of marketing, also things like rents associated with the burgage plots. So Andover as a town is revealed through the enrolment of a particular space in processes of assemblage, processes which differentiate it from surrounding um, settlements, but also create links of similarity and more concrete commercial links with other places. So if we move to the east of Hampshire, we can move to the town of Alton, which unfortunately I don't have a plan of, but we have this nice aerial photograph. Um, and Alton also developed on a royal manor and is believed to be the site of a market referred to in Doomsday. So as in Andover, there is pre-conquest occupation here, um, close to the church. However, the form of the town is quite different. You can see in the photograph this pronounced central street. So we have a, what we call a ribbon settlement, um, centred on, on the main road from London down to Exeter. Now, Alton um, developed close to a crossroads, a Roman crossroads, where there was a, town, a Roman town called Needham, just to the east of the medieval town. And I think what we can see here are example, is an example of historical processes resonating um, in the present, in the medieval present. So we can see the Roman road network persisting, coding flows of goods and resources, directing them across the landscape in particular ways, making Alton a persistent place within the landscape. So although it wasn't planned in the same way as Andover, I think we can see the town revealing itself through the formalisation of these iterative gathering processes. It was already distinctive as a persistent place, but the formalisation, when a borough charter was granted, um, categorised it differently from the settlements around it and other places, and made it more similar to other places regarded as towns. Now, the last town that I want to touch on briefly is Petersfield, also in eastern Hampshire. And the development of Petersfield is less straightforward. It's traditionally seen as being a typical medieval planted town. There's no written reference to it prior to the 12th century. But Keith Lilly, by undertaking plan analysis, has proposed, proposed an alternative narrative where he sees the church here existing within a, an enclosure which becomes fossilised in the urban landscape. And he proposes that the Earl of Gloucester founded a town here to um, capitalise on an existing informal market associated with the church. Now, Peterfield is situated at the divide between two geological zones, the Chalk Downland and the Clay Weald, make it a great location for marketing produce from these different environments. And it's also situated on a major north-south route and a major east-west route. 
We also see here the extension of privileges to the burgesses, um, suggesting a concerted effort to found a town, possibly stimulated by the contemporary development of a new port at Portsmouth. Now, associated with Petersfield, we also have fields, likely farmed by the townspeople, and archaeological evidence has also provided evidence for cultivation within the town, um, highlighting that even within this apparently urban place, we can see elements of rural activity, um, as we would typically see it, um, as being present. So, how can we think through this a little bit further? Towns, I think, are more than materialisations of a seigneurial wish to found a town. Rather, they emerge from and are effective within sets of social relationships. These town plans share common characteristics, but emerge from distinctive sets of relationships. Now, in their writing, Deleuze and Tari emphasise middles. They see processes emerging from other processes. And I think that plan analysis demonstrates that these towns don't begin with the laying out of burgage plots, but rather a part of longer term social processes. So even Petersfield, which is seen as a typical planted town, emerged from longer term gathering processes, the use of the church. So in all three cases, we can see different sets of gathering processes um, creating situated presences within the landscape, persistent places which became urban, their form developing with their urban character. So as places of iterative gatherings, these processes can be seen as territorializations. They literally create spatial territories which connect them to people in their wider surroundings and conceptually um, territorialize them into distinct um, entities as towns. So it was these ongoing um, performances which coded flows of social action, allowing these places to be re reiterated and to become distinctive from other places. So I think that if we view these towns as assemblages, we can perceive them as iterative comings together of human and material actons in specific spaces, reiterating processes of placemaking and coding flows of goods, resources and people so that they can come together in some places and not others. Now, often associated with towns are charters, and charters are seen as formalising informal marketing processes, and therefore we can see them as further coding action as long as they are continually reiterated and paid attention to. It's no good having a charter if you don't use it because it's not doing anything. So in Andover, the foundation of the Guild Merchant and the granting of a borough charter can be related to the growth of burgage plots along the high street, whilst in Petersfield, uh, an area of expansion can be associated with the regranting of the borough charter on the basis of excavated evidence. Even in Alton, which has a more informal layout, there are formalised plots which can be related to the process of granting the charter. Now, assemblage theory allows us to consider performances of towns at different scales and the implications of one scale for another. Deleuze and Guattari coin the term deterritorialization for thinking about the concept whereby an actum can be part of different assemblages, pulling them into each other, creating ruptures and frictions, and I think here also creating agency. And the agency to acquire a charter is one such moment. We see the intersection of those localised performances of place, those informal gatherings through marketing, and um, of those sort of more dispersed networks which I talked about before. So I think it's oversimplistic to see these towns as simply as a materialisation of seigneurial intent. Rather, I think the plan and the charter are mutually constituted. Oh dear. Um, the plan without the charter is simply a division of space which is meaningless. or It's made durable through the materiality of the buildings and the divisions, but it has to be reiterated and re-performed to maintain its form. Similarly, the charter is meaningless if it's not enrolled in the performance of the place to which it relates. However, when entangled the performance of place, with the performance of place, we can see the town plan emerging with social action. So we shouldn't see the charter as a script and the plan as a stage, but rather as the two being participants in a process of improvisation within the bounds provided by the coding of behaviour. So the division of space into burgage plots was underpinned by the charter and processes of burgage tenure, enfolding the making of domestic spaces into the performance of the administration of the town and therefore networks of lordship, for example. So to see planning as top-down or bottom-up is misleading. 
Rather, we can perceive of the agency for planning, be that the construction of a house or the laying out of a street grid, emerging from discourse between different scales. The Charter provided certain freedoms negotiated across scales, the freedom to specialise in particular economic activity, for example. Simultaneously became the ability to acquire cash rents and market tolls. So within the town, the plan coded social relations through the enrolment of the Charter into performance, limiting marketing to particular times and places, locking people into particular domestic arrangements, for example. So towns are effective in social relations. They code flows of goods and money. And this, um, a similar um, perspective is put forward in Astrid Van Ooyen in her work on Roman cities, which sees Roman cities as what she calls switching points, so it's equivalent to points on a railway track, essentially, whereby flows of goods might pass through these and be steered along um, alternative trajectories. So we can see town plans as centralisations of activity, which would otherwise be dispersed and temporary. By making places permanent, from one perspective, they become an instrument for estate management. From another, they become, as Alanoyan talks about, transformative places. Places which maybe transform resources into goods or goods into commodities, for example. So the point I'm trying to argue here is that plans unite towns as a category, but also serve to define them in relation to other places as distinctive components of effective networks, with the plan being more than a representation of urbanity, but fundamental for the ability of these places to follow distinct trajectories, which, through their deterritorialized character, also act upon the trajectories taken by settlements within a manor or an estate, and the people who live within them, and the goods and resources which they produce, use, and market. But of course, plans don't just have to represent urbanity. They're also enrolled in social processes which push places along urbanising trajectories. However, within these spaces, urbanisation might be seen to reveal itself through certain processes and not through others. I've already talked about the evidence of the cultivation in Petersfield, for example. So can we see similar joinings in other elements of urban planning? Ribbon settlements such as Alton, are a common form of rural settlement in the Hampshire downland, and some of these settlements have markets, perhaps making them difficult to distinguish from urban centres. An example might be the village of Botley, interpreted as a failed town. But others were clearly elements in a wider commercial network. So the Bishop of Winchester, for example, had an extensive estate which had clearly defined boroughs on it, but also markets in ribbon settlements which were clearly subsidiary to these towns and, process and worked as part of a, a commercial whole. Other processes might be seen as having parallels between urban and rural settlements. So we have on the screen a plan of the excavated village of Foxcott just outside Andover, where we also have evidence of the formalised land division, plots being aligned along a principal route, for example. Now, whilst the activities which occurred within these plots and the economy of the place was obviously very different, the process of formal division derived from um, uh, uh, derived from the materialization of social practices um, of uh, b -b -b of what <laughs> of taxation and tenure um, can at a basic level at least be seen to blur a clear distinction between processes of urban and rural placemaking. So different tenural um, arrangements between town and country translated these processes differently as they're entangled with different sets of social processes guiding them along different trajectories. So rather than seeing regular plots and planning as a distinctively urban feature, when in fact if we look at processes of land division, towns not necessarily reveal themselves as distinctive, I think we should instead question the processes through which regulated, nucleated settlement spaces emerged and became distinctive from one another. So, in conclusion, I would argue that towns develop along diverse but related trajectories. There are things which unite towns, but also things which cause them to be distinctive. Plans and charters, I think, are mutually constituted. They both find meaning through entanglement in particular processes, which we might term urbanisation. And I think it's misleading to see one as reflecting the other. Plans play a role in coding behaviour and making places distinctive. I think the, the, the geography of the town essentially is active, not just a representation of urbanity. And finally, I think the assemblage approach, which I wasn't necessarily able to dwell on as much as I quite, would have quite liked, allows us to move from seeing plans simply as stages for action to being important components of urban sociality. Thank you.